Hey everyone, Jonathan here. I'm the creator of JohnnyCom, this channel all about retro tech, video games, and pretty much anything else that I find interesting. This video is a little bit different because typically you're used to seeing me do retrospectives or documentaries on video games, consoles, stuff like that. When I met Joe, I had this idea for a video. I thought it would be all about his business and what he does about his shop and the history of the store. But as I got to know Joe, we kind of formed a really quick friendship almost immediately. And as I got to know him more and more and eventually sat down to do this little interview with him, I realized that the video was taking a little bit of a different direction. It became something really special to me that I hope you guys can also appreciate. What started as an interview about his history and how he got into the business really evolved and devolved in some ways to a simple discussion about our interests and why we love doing what we love. And of course, tons of discussions about our common interests, both between me and Joe, and I'm sure you guys viewing the video as well. Sometimes, for some inexplicable reason, I feel like people come into your life. And meeting Joe for me was this really incredible experience. Because not only did I discover this amazing store full of retro technology and somebody who could repair the stuff that I hold so dear, but also because I was able to make a new friend. It's important for me to note that I met Joe and found his store at a particularly low point in my life. I had just published my video on Gunpei Yokoi and the Game Boy and nobody watched it. Now that's not something I'm really complaining about, you know, there's ups and downs with YouTube and I had a really big takeoff with that PSP video and ever since then it's been kind of like an uphill battle where the subscribers are going up but the views are staying the same. And of course, I totally appreciate you guys watching, That's this is not me complaining, it's just when you put so much time and effort into a video and then nobody watches it, it can do a little bit to your confidence. I was losing motivation to film or edit anything, which is something that I usually take a lot of pride and joy in. Joe has really brought a light into my life and I really feel fortunate that I was able to get to know him while making this video. Talking with him reminded me that as long as you're doing something that you love and you're having fun doing it and you really have a passion for it, that's really all you need. I hope you guys enjoy this video. It's really unique, especially compared to the content that I would usually make. And as such, it shows some growing pains. It's my first time doing a video of anything like this. It's educational, it's wacky at times, it's kind of all over. But I think that it captures a lot about what makes hobbies and connecting with people who have similar interests to you so special. So yeah, I kind of just wanted to preface the video by giving you guys a, an idea of what to expect from this video. I hope you guys enjoy it, and let's get started. Located in a small town in Virginia is a building that from a distance looks like a normal house. But when you get closer, you'll discover that it's actually a business. The signage and window displays start to tell you what to expect. Electronics repairs. Today, the statement electronics repairs usually triggers ideas of people getting their cracked phone screens replaced or their iPhone is stopped booting up and they want somebody to fix it for them. But when you walk into this shop, you immediately know that's not what you're going to see here, because this is a true blue retro analog tube technology service shop. And it's like stepping into the past. And it's owned by a guy who's just as interesting as the objects he services and sells. Very, very cold. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was I've been in electronics since I was nine years old. So I've been in it 53 years, and I still love every moment of it. And I love electronics all my life. I watch it go from tubes to solid state to flat panels and all the changes all between them. So I still love it. Even at this age, I still, every day, it still amazes me. And I'm still motivated to find, learn more stuff. People say, well, you know, at 62, you would think you want to retire or something. No, I'm not going to do it. I'm, I'm going to 
living as long as I can doing this stuff. One of the things I heard over and over again during this discussion with Joe was how much he simply loved messing with electronics. But I wanted to know how that started. In Joe's own words, it all started when his father began fixing TVs with him around and how that led into other fields while Joe discovered what he loved about mechanical hardware and electronics. Nine years old, because my dad stopped messing with TVs and he was learning how to fix them and he showed me what he was learning and some had reason to just stick to me and I start fixing and stuff at nine years old and I worked at a TV shop at 14, learning to rode my bike after school to the shop and just start learning more stuff about electronics at 14. I remember my dad would take the tubes out the TV and, and put them in the bag and I will walk down to the drugstore about a block away and get a test them in the tube tester because we didn't have one. And I would check them and, and tell my dad which one he needs or whatever and he would just buy them, whatever he needs to find them was bad. When 1980 came in with TVs, went to Sada State, and they stopped making using tubes in them. A lot of shops I knew that a lot of technicians couldn't take the switch over. They didn't learn to change the times. And I did because I had well, I wanted two choices. I figured I had to keep learning this stuff or just stop and go somewhere else. Uh, I did take a break uh, when I was a teenager. I got into mopeds, motorcycles, dirt bikes, go-karts, I learned about engines. I didn't see nothing moving. I wanted to fix something I can actually physically see, see it moving and working. Um, but I mean, I loved it. I worked on cars and I still do, but electronics was a year-round thing. And I figured out I need a job that I could do a year-round. It's a little hard to go work on motorcycles in the snow and ice. <laughs> yeah, people don't ride bikes in the snow and ice. Joe's love of moving parts and electronics was established in an early age, but I was also curious about all of the pinball machines and classic arcade cabinets he had around the shop. This led us into another fantastic story about a blizzard in 1981 that led into Joe's next experience with technology and learning how to repair new things. And then in 81, me and my buddy, there was a music company across the street where I live, and the roof caved in because of a snowstorm. And they needed somebody to help clean the warehouse out because the roof caved in and the machine got smashed and all that. So I went ahead, and me and my buddy went ahead, and they hired us to do that. We started doing it, and then they found out I worked on electronics. And the one of the owners said, hey, look, if you want to get a job here, if you can go back there and grab a couple of pinball machines or whatever, and if you fix them within 30 days, they have a full-time job. And well, that's the way I got into the music business and stayed in it for 12 years. So it was really happenstance. Like it just got, you got hired for one job. Right. Somebody heard you did something else, said, hey, can you do this? And I just learned it. Nobody told me how to work on this stuff behind me. Uh, I had to teach everything to myself. People ask me, did I go to a lot of school and all that? No. It's a gift. People say it's a gift from God or whatever. It's just in me. I just know it. It's something you love doing. <laughs> I just do it and I love it. And people can understand how I know, but I just know. And when it comes to reading, another interesting quirk of Joe's is that he can't just sit down and read a book. It has to be about how things work. When I read books, you know, I can read books on electronics. I can read books on mechanical stuff. But when it came to books like uh, storybooks or novels, or I had a problem reading them. They couldn't keep, keep, attention. keep getting attention. My mind would not go that way. It has to be something that I really need to know and understand. One thing I was immediately able to relate to was Joe's love of simply not knowing what he's going to see that day. For myself, finding a video game in a thrift shop gives me a quick adrenaline rush, an excitement that I've found a new piece of video game history that I can appreciate. For Joe, it's much of the same feeling, only people bring these amazing pieces of tech from the past straight to him. And much how I get a sense of pride out of fixing and cleaning old video games and consoles, Joe takes pride in knowing that not everyone can fix these vintage pieces of equipment. Every day I open that door, I just don't know what's going to come in or what goes out. I have no idea. And that's what gets me all the time, is what comes in that door. It amazes me. But one of my customers brought in two beta machines I just fixed for him. He picked them up. I know I brought in like like 20 CRT televisions. Yeah, no. <laughs> and I had another one picked a couple up yesterday. Uh, it just amazes me because I haven't worked on them for a long time. They, 
when flight panels came around, that's what I focus on. And about flight panels now is it's pretty much over with in a sense because the the, re, the price has come down so much, and people are not going to afford to pay what technicians like me need to get paid to do this stuff. And so I focus on the vintage stereo equipment because nobody you just can't go buy that. If you have stuff from the 70s, you need somebody to work on it. Just like the pinball machines and everything else, you need somebody to work on it. You can't go to Walmart and buy one of them. While discussing why I love CRTs with Joe, he gave me a great rundown of exactly why so many retro media fans like myself find the images on CRTs to be preferable to more modern displays. And as it turns out, I'm not the only one with an interest in these old TVs. CRT TVs, the revolution is totally different than the flat panel. The problem with flat panel, when you hook up something old, like the VCR or Nintendo or whatever, the TV's gonna try to upscale and it's gonna find all the defects in the picture and it's gonna make it look really bad. And there's nothing you can do about that besides go back to a CRT TV and actually give it the way it should be looked like. Do you see a lot of people like me coming in here with older stuff? Yes. <laughs> I have about a half a dozen people in your age bracket that's just getting into the older stuff and it amazes me. Uh, I have nothing, you know, I think it's cool. Vinyl has come back. Um, a guy brought a 12 year old girl in here and she's into ABBA. <laughs> and I'm going and see one vinyl. It's like, I can't believe a 12 year old one vinyl. I was curious about Joe's views on why things like vintage equipment become something that people revisit and why newer generations who may be discovering them for the first time find them so fascinating. From Joe's point of view, it's the boomerang effect we see so often in every other part of our lives. Well, I think, well, basically on pinball machines, uh, it's something you can't, you just can't play a video game that way. Pinball machine, every game you play is different. Every time you play, you don't know what your score is going to be and what you want, how good you're going to be. It's skill. And you can't, I mean, you get good at video games, everything was the same, basically the same thing over and over again. Um, but no, everything, it's just everything I like everything else it just comes around again. And vintage stereo equipment, the sound quality is totally different than digital. A lot of digital stuff, when it's, it's digital, it, it's chopped. Analog is not like that. Analog is just wide open. So the music's gonna be from the low end to the high end, and you wanna hear everything. Now, another thing that immediately caught my attention and made me appreciate Joe was his love of music from all genres. While we both share a love of things like analog synthesizers, sound effects, odd, out of the ordinary music, and Weird Al Yankovic, there was one artist he confessed his love for that I wasn't expecting. I was very happy to see just how much he loved their music, and how much appreciation he has for songwriting. For myself, My Chemical Romance was a huge influence, with their theatrics and storytelling and lyricism being just as important as the songs and performance. So when Joe told me one of his favorite artists was Alice Cooper, well, I'm sure you can put the pieces together to understand why I was able to relate. Even when I was growing up, I probably heard of Alice Cooper when I was a teenager, but I really did not get into his music till later. I can just relate to all his music, and I liked him a lot because he was different. He was outside the box, and I, I'm really picky about lyrics. I'm really into the lyrics. And Alice Cooper was one of the people that wrote all his lyrics on every album he ever made. Every album you buy will have all the lyrics to all the songs. And I spent hours and hours remembering all the lyrics. So I just I just relate. Music is my escape because I don't do anything like alcohol, drugs, and things. So the only way I can escape from daily pressure or whatever. I have to have music. And music is a way for me to relax and escape from reality and just, I have to find a way to out, you know, let it out. And music's the only way. So I have Alice Cooper, I have Me Love, Billy Idol, Rob Zombie, Ozzy. I mean, it's, it's a long band. <laughs> and I got stuff that people that we've heard of at home. I don't go in the box of music. Uh, I don't go in the mainstream. I like me, you know, I listen to some, but most of my music way out the mainstream line. And my daughter's the same way because she raised up with music with me and she 
He barely ever listens to mainstream music. A lot of songs mean a lot to me because of the lyrics. And it puts me in what year or what I was dealing with at that time because of the song. And so it's very important to understand. A loaded question, I admit, was asking Joe how he felt about the quality of modern electronics versus vintage electronics. Planned obsolescence is very real, and Joe is mostly of the same belief. My take is, is not improved. And it's improved in the sense of technology, the picture quality, the revolutions, but the overall quality of the TVs is not like they used to be. Because LEDs does not last as long as they said it would because LED lights burn out and that's the fault. You cannot operate an LED panel TV or 24-7, leave it on, thinking it's going to last you more than six months if it's, if it's on day and night, day and night. A CRT, you can leave it on for years, but LED, not so much. They're going to the lights are going to burn out and that's, unfortunately, that's all brands. Like I said, if you watch it all the time, it's going to, the LEDs are going to burn out. Besides the LED lights, you got the panel, could get defective. Or you could have a power supply problem or a main board problem. Uh, besides that, it's cut and dry. I mean, you know, it's not like you actually troubleshoot, troubleshoot. Like the CRT TVs, when I go in the old ones, you actually have to work on the sucker board itself and replace the components on the board. On new ones, not so much. You really just replace the board. Uh, that controls it because it's mostly all computer and, and LEDs. I mean, you can replace LEDs. I've done many of them, but they're hard. I mean, people think they're easy. They're not. You got to take the panel out. And if you take the screen out, if you're not careful, you're going to crack it. And you crack it, you might as well just buy yourself another TV because it's over with. You can learn a lot about somebody by asking them what their favorite, well, anything is. But movies are a special one. When I asked Joe what his top three movies were, it was as if I was asking him to solve world hunger. Not that I can blame him, it is difficult to narrow it down when there are so many great films out there. But he did have a few to mention in no particular order. And some really great points on why those movies are so special. Uh, damn, that's, that's, man, because it's so many. Um, well, I guess it was a lot of one of them because it's just, because what it is. There's way too many movies. <laughs> that I can way, with. way too many comedy movies from the 80s. Pride of Breakfast Club, because I can relate to it. Until today, I think kids can relate to that movie because that's true, have everybody classify you and judge you for what you are, but without knowing what, who you really are. And I felt that way in school my own self. I was in my own little section, people would be, I mean, so I know how that movie, the movie starts great because of that reason. Again, you pick one of my favorite movies. Like, I love, I love Breakfast Club, like I said. It's, it's because we can relate to it. Yeah, Anybody was in high school or school can relate to that movie, even today. Speaking of favorite things, I was also curious if Joe had a favorite piece of equipment he loves to work on. The answer didn't surprise me at all, given his love of music and his love of seeing the parts that make things work and operate. I guess in the audio line, the machines I worked the most, the most was reel to reel take that. Uh, I started with them. One of the first ones I worked on was reel to reels when I was young. And I just love the machines because it's mechanical and audio together. So you have two things working on. That was got me into the amusement business because amusements, besides mechanical ones, electronic ones, you see more besides just electronics. You see mechanical parts moving, you see this happening. TVs. My favorite brands was RCA, Xena, Mandalox, brands like that. TVs was one of the ones I love to work on the most. And I love working on COTs. Now the real old TVs, I mean, heck, back in the 50s, uh, two TVs, color TVs back then, they could have 25, 26 tubes in it. <laughs> and it don't take you a long time. I just like working on everything. And I like somebody bringing something in that I haven't worked on. They catch me off guard with something different. I said, okay. People are bring me mixers in here, uh, small appliances. I said, sure. I'm not taking a look at it, even though I haven't worked on many of them in my life, but or anything different. If it has a wire on it, if you can plug it in or battery operate, I need to know how it's working. One thing about me, you know, a lot of 
boys when they're kids to take toys apart and destroy them and don't put them back together. Me, I took them apart, understand how it works, and put it back together and it still worked. <laughs> I didn't destroy my toys because I, I just had to take it apart to learn how it worked how the motor works and the gears and all that, whatever toy it was. I think some people are just wired like that though. Huh? Well, funny joke. Yeah, wired. I'm wired. <laughs> yes, I'm wired like that. Some people just take things at face value and then there are people like you and me who are like, but how? <laughs> yeah, how? My question has always been how. Yeah. Uh, you know, I need to know how something works. Engineers amazes me. You guys that actually design the stuff, uh, I never got that part where I can actually design circuits. I know some circuits I can maybe design, but engineers amazes me how they got to the point where they can know what parts to put where and all that. Uh, my father did learn the theory behind a lot of that in books, but I never caught on with that. I was always the one on the troubleshooting end. I learned that part of it, how to fix repair the item. And I do know manufacturers will build stuff to fail the way they locate what parts they use and where they put the parts and where the parts are next to something else it causing the heat problems and all this they know it's gonna fail it's part of the plan uh the engineers ain't stupid because <laughs> you know i've worked on enough crt tvs where they put capacitors and next to the heated resistors that the resistors get hot of course that's going to cause the capacitors to dry up because the heat coming off the resistors joe won't lie to you though Messing with anything electric is dangerous. But despite the dangers, it didn't stop Joe from performing some less than safe experiments when he was a kid first discovering his hobby. Uh, you know, if I sit here and tell you I've never been burned or never been shocked, uh, it'd be a lie. <laughs> <laughs> it still happens today, and I have to be more careful because of my age, but getting shocked is no fun. Um, but one thing you learn in electronics, uh, you have to respect electricity. You gotta remember it's there and it will hurt you. You know, I remember I say it was 12 and I had the floor model stereo. And I was into, you know, that era was, you know, I'm not really, I, mean, I like disco music, but I won't really into disco, like dance and all that yeah. crap. <laughs> but I wanted some dancing lights. So I figured I'd take a string of Christmas lights, you know, little miniature lights and wire it to the output circuit of the stereo and plug it in. Don't ever do that. <laughs> I warn you now, don't try that trick. The satellites caught on fire, the stereo went up in smoke. <laughs> now that's a funny story because when I was a kid, we used to take my eight, I had Lionel train transformers, and I would take capacitors and filters out of TVs and stuff and put them in the can and hook my transformers to it and explode them and <laughs> make all that smoke and wax and paper go flying in the woods. Yes, but it was fun. Uh, <laughs> Okay, now this is probably the part of the video a lot of you guys are waiting for. I had to ask Joe about his history with video games. He's worked on arcade cabinets, pinball machines, CRT displays, and so many other things that are related to the video game field. And of course, Joe is a gamer, even if he doesn't have the time to play as much as he'd like. I got the original Nintendo, I got Super Nintendo, I got Nintendo 64, I got the first PlayStation, I got the Xbox, PlayStation 4. All the systems are still hooked up at home. Did you start with the Nintendo? Was that your first? Yes. No. My first one was Odyssey. No, I, you had a Odyssey. Box, Odyssey. I remember that when I was a kid, my dad got it. And I remember that. And then I got into Atari. I had Atari 2600s. I had Atari 5200s. Uh, then I got into the Nintendo. I had a Commodore somewhere in that little mix. Is that your original? Yeah, original. Kind of, that's crazy. That's my, uh, my wife bought the, I think we bought the Nintendo when we got married back in the 80s. It was so fun. And I still got all the original games. I got all the Donkey Kongs. I got, I even got a Game Boy. I even got the Game Boy adapter. They take the Game Boy and put it in. It's like a Super Nintendo. I got that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes, I got all the cool stuff. And one thing that really threw me for a loop was Joe bringing up one of his favorite games, a genre and a franchise that I didn't expect him to be into until we had this little sit down and discussion. Joe is a huge fan of paranormal and mystery media, and he loves Silent Hill. The uh, only thing I did get into years ago is Silent Hill when it came out. I was addicted. I mean, I play it every time I got off of work at night, if it goes to bed, you know, 
<laughs> and I got, I bought each one. I bought Silent Hill 1, 2, and of course I got the movies too. You know they're remaking Silent Hill 2. Are like, they really? Yeah, they're making. Oh, it. Man. it looks really nice. I can't wait for it. Yeah, most of my, the, my most of my PlayStation games or Xbox games, if it's in our car racing games, I uh, like the supernatural games. If, if it's something creepy or off the edge, I pretty much like to play it. It was at this point in the discussion where I'd confessed to Joe why I think his shop means a lot to me, even though I've really only just discovered it. I don't know how to explain this, but here it goes. Sometimes I visit certain places, whether it be a place in nature or a random parking lot, maybe a store or a friend's home, and it just feels like I'm meant to be there in that moment. Or perhaps it's simply a special spot in the world made for me where I feel I belong. Whether it's something in the environment that makes me feel at home or just a deeper, more spiritual feeling that I belong or feel welcomed and at peace. It's a special brand of nostalgia that, for me, feels separate from the typical nostalgic feelings you can get from viewing an old movie you love or playing that old NES game you beat over and over again as a kid. Joe added a great point in that the people he meets at his business all seem to have similar experiences. Yeah, when you get older, a lot of things, uh, when you were a child, you go back to. You remember it's, it's a comfort zone, you can relax, you can be part of it, you just remember a lot of stuff. You know, a lot of people, that's why a lot of people now get old vintage equipment because a lot of the guys I meet was in the service overseas and a lot of this equipment came from overseas. And he, they brought it back because it was cheaper buying it over there back in the 70s. Getting to a point where they want to live some of their memories. And so they bring it out and I'll have to work on it and buy vinyl and bring it back when they was young. One thing I had to ask is if Joe ever stops to think about the impact he has on other people. Being someone that can fix this vintage equipment today is almost like being able to provide a time machine for them to revisit their happier memories. The answer was exactly what I expected, but more endearing than I thought I'd hear. It led into his own memories with his family, his wife, and daughter. And it was really nice to hear that someone else out there misses the things that we used to have that are sadly gone today. You do all this stuff, you, you fix the, the TVs, you fix audio equipment, you fix vintage stuff, and you obviously have a passion for it. That's why you keep doing it and mm -hmm. why you want to keep doing it. You said you have no intention of retiring. No. It, it's got to be a cool feeling when you, I'm, I'm sure when you see somebody like me come in who's younger and is into it, but to be able to know that like, what's this person going to do with this? Why do they want this? For me, it's like you were talking about these old video games that I grew up with and I still love to this day. It transports me back to that time. Right, me that, right. that I remember being at my grandma's house. Right. I remember when my dad took me to Funko Land and I, <laughs> and I bought all these old Nintendo yeah. games. Like it takes me back to that, and it's it's a really powerful emotional thing for me. Does that give you gratification knowing that? Yes, I that, love I love younger people like you, that generation, like my daughter and stuff, that still want to hold on to the stuff from the past and bring it back. It gives us the future. You know, I mean, I, I don't want to see it all go away. Uh, she, my daughter would love video stores to come back, to rent movies again. <laughs> she loves to rent movies. I mean, we enjoy every Friday night go, you know, go Blockbuster or whatever, rent movies for the weekend. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it was a family thing back in the early 90s for us to do. And I think a lot of people, especially young people, miss that. They really do. My daughter misses it. She's 37 she misses that. She missed the fun of going into a video store and rent movies. And I do. I mean, me and my wife misses it. I mean, it was just a lot of fun. You go in and hopefully you find a good movie. God knows how many times you find a bad one. Oh, this ain't no good. <laughs> Will video stores come back? I don't know. It's going to be hard because it's streaming. Maybe for your generation, they might be some people might go back into it. When Joe brought up video rental stores, it was kind of an eye-opening moment for me. We've all seen physical media and more recently physical video games start to go the way of the video rental store. Simply put, it's going away slowly. But there is a lot to be said for having a physical copy of your favorite movie, album, or video game. Man, I still buy CDs uh, because I like the idea. I own it. It's physically in my hand. It's mine. I mean, if I pay you download it or stream it and you put it in the cloud, it's, I bought it, but it's just in the cloud. Yeah. It's not in my hand. I can't, I can't <laughs> take it with me. <laughs> to kind of close our discussion, I wanted to get Joe's view on a more modern piece of technology. 
but one that interestingly is actually trying to recreate something from the past. There's, there's so many intricacies to what makes old better and what makes new better and how they kind of all learn from each other. For me, the TV thing is always gonna, I'm always gonna prefer tubes. There's just something about the way they look. I have a device, it's called the Retro Tank. Have you heard of this? No, I haven't. It's, it's a box and it's got your RCA input, your S video, start. Right. It's got HDMI out and it goes to your TV. It upscales all your old retro equipment. Okay. Mostly for video games, but I, I've been using it for VHS lately too. But does it do a good job? Yes. It, the whole point of this box is to recreate the look of the CRT. Okay. That is exclusively what they got made it for. And just released a new one, an updated one for 4K. But we have gotten to the point where people still want to play old video games. They want to watch VHS. They games. want to put it on the flat panel. They want it on the new TV, TV and they want it to look like the old thing. So this thing not only upscales it and makes it look good, but it has the option to add like scan lines so that it can look like a CRT. So a, it will add, uh, has black frame insertion. Wow, that's cool. So it'll like flash. I'm like, what is all of it? Like, and it looks pretty good. Well, that's cool. And there's no lag. It's not the same as a CRT. No. But it looks really good. It blows me. That's kind of cool that I was able to do that. Of course, Joe beat me to the punch because even though I thought the retro tink was something new, he reminded me that once again, a piece of vintage equipment was already doing the same thing for him. And maybe it's a little bit older, but it still gets the job done. You know, at home, what I use, I don't know if I got all the different formats. Uh, of course, I don't have beta right now, but I do have um, the VCR. I do have a laser disc, uh, HD DVDs, DVDs, Blu-rays, of course. But a lot of the laser disc and VCR run through a video processor from JVC made back in the 90s. And it filters out, it still makes it look good on the flat panel because it filters out all the well, garbage or whatever you want to call it. And it's, and it's a pretty cool box. I like that little JVC box. So how do I wrap up this video and end it in a way that feels right? As I said at the start of the video, and as I'm sure you've seen and heard, if you made it this far, Joe and I truly talked about all kinds of things. And when I was first editing this video, I was panicked that I had failed as an interviewer. Maybe I did. The topics were all over the place, my questions weren't always as clear as they could have been, at times we both seemed so enthusiastic about what we were discussing that we'd cut each other off or maybe finish each other's sentences. But then I realized something. The answer was in front of me the whole time. The whole purpose of this video, perhaps its message, is much greater than something like being a documentary on a repair shop or a person that runs it. It's really about human connections, no matter how small or different, or perhaps how interesting a topic may be to you, but not to someone else. What really shines through to me about this whole project you've witnessed is that Joe and I have connected over things that we both appreciate. I found Joe because I needed someone to repair my CRTs that had more experience than I did. But what I discovered is someone who's just as much like me as they are different, but someone that I wanted to get to know better and learn from. And that's what I really think this video is all about. If you ever feel like you're alone or like nobody might care about you or something you find interesting, they're most definitely out there. You just have to be willing to put yourself out there and go find them. Maybe you'll make a friend or two along the way. Something tells me you'll be seeing more of Joe on the channel if he doesn't peek this video. In fact, we're already making plans for a few projects. So call it a hunch, but I think more focused videos on repair projects are coming, featuring myself, and Joe. That's all for this episode. Thanks for watching.